All right, then. Good morning, everybody. As Vince said, I've been here for 25 years working with remote monitors. I have, have been supporting them, installing them, and I've seen just about every scenario out there. At least I'd like to say I've seen every scenario, but it seems like there's one or two that stump me every now and then, but we keep working at it here. Today, we're going to talk about the RM5, some of the best practices, and we're going to start out talking about dome placement, wiring, our power for our relay and power supply, and bullhorn tools. We're going to start out with the cell and satellite placement. When we're setting these up, you're looking for a signal of two to five for the satellite and anywhere from zero to 120, negative 120 on the cell. As you get closer to zero on the cell, that's your better signal. As you get cl closer to negative 120, you're starting to get um, to the point where you're not gonna have any signal and not be able to transmit. So if you're somewhere in between zero and negative 120, you're pretty good there. On the satellite, you definitely want to be the two to five range. When you're placing these domes out there, the satellite has to have clear view of the sky one direction or the other. In the past, with our previous units, they had to be on the south side of any building. On this one, it can be north, south, east, or west. The satellites are always moving one direction or the other. So you'll get some ser service as long as you got clear view of the sky. Now with the cell unit, you have to have the AT&T coverage. Now, when you're out there placing this dome, we can tell you what AT&T tells us for coverage there. But if you remember that commercial, have you heard me now? Or can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's similar to that moving it a couple feet one direction or the other can make a difference. If you don't have any signal, you don't have any signal, but if you got a weak signal, just shifting it a little bit can make a big difference. I've seen moving it three inches increase signal to a point where not being able to transmit to transmitting without any problems. Now our uh, basic components are the dome, the power supply, the relay, and the IO module. And we're gonna talk about each of those as we go through this presentation. Let's talk about first about our pre-installation wiring. When hooking the wires up, it is best to take a reading of the rectifier, your volts, amps, measure your taps to find out where you're gonna put your power supply and relay. I can't tell you how many times early on where I just went out there, started to install. And then when I got done, readings didn't look correct. And there's no way of knowing, were they looking like this before if I didn't take a measurement ahead of time? I usually keep a book with me and I write down everything about the rectifier when I come up there, the readings before, the readings after, my tap settings, what my readings are on my tap. So that way I know when I am hooking everything up, what I need to hook it up to and there's no mistakes afterwards. Now wiring, we pre-wire channels one and two to a terminal block. We have channels three and four. We don't pre-wire that because about 98% of our customers only read channels one and two. So we didn't want to clutter up your rectifier with another terminal block of something that you're not using most of the time. And as I say, we default to channels one and two with amps being one, two being volts. Now with this unit here, it can read plus or minus 150 volts uh, on any of the four channels. So you're not tied to channel two for your volts like you've been uh, with some of our previous units. We have our power supply and relay hooked up onto a terminal block. And we, we hook those up or hook those up for you in advance so it's easy to connect up to. 
We have the um, purple wire is your positive for amps. Yellow wire is positive for volts. Just keep in mind for anything on the DC side, the solid wire is your positive. So if you're hooking it up and you put your negative to that solid wire, you're going to read a negative reading when you get back to uh, Bullhorn Web. And if you don't have, don't catch it before you leave, it may cause you a trip back to the field. Uh, always want to make sure I verify all that before I leave the site. Now hooking up the relay and power supply, we're looking for 10 to 30 volts AC on the taps. That brown and the brown and white wire are your relay and power supply wires. I like to hook them up to just two separate tap bolts there rather than separating all four wires. It's a lot easier if you find that range 10 to 30 volts. So both of them can be hooked up there. Want to make sure you keep your browns together and your white browns together. We've had to do a troubleshooting where one customer put brown and white on one tap and brown and white on the other. And unfortunately, when he did that, he got the positive and negative from the relay together and the positive and negative from the power supply together. So the unit didn't work. Just one of those tips to watch out for when hooking up your unit. Now the power supply, don't hook it up directly into your incoming AC for 120 or 240. So now you're asking, well, what happens if I do that? Because all of my other units in the past, we hooked directly up into the AC. Well, let me tell you, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to blow this power supply. It's not going to let the smoke out. You'll be good. It's just not going to power your unit. You just need to make sure you take it off your incoming AC and put it on your taps where you can get that 7 to 30 volts AC. Our engineers thought ahead on this one and thought, well, because everybody's done it in the past, we don't want to uh, cause damage to this power supply if somebody does mistakenly hook it up directly into the AC. Hey, Mike, and don't, just to clarify on the power supply, that is AC and DC, correct? That is correct. Most of the time on the rec fires, we're hooking up to the AC, but it can hook up to DC as well because there are plenty of situations where you don't have AC at some of the, the solar uh, powers out there. Dome placement, we talked about earlier, but one thing I did want to point out here is don't hook up your antenna cable to your dome and then to your IO module before you get power to the unit. And the reason for that is there's no on off switch for this RMU. Once you hook that cable up from the, the dome where it's a basically your cell or satellite dome to the IO module, that dome starts to um, look for a for signal. And if it doesn't see power, it starts a timer says, after two hours, I'm gonna shut off to save my battery because I've got a battery in that dome. And if that battery falls below 3.6 volts, it's not gonna be able to transmit. So we wanna save that battery voltage as much as we can. Now, reason we picked two hours our development team went out and did research across the United States and found out the average power outage across the United States is two hours. So we figure if we're out longer than two hours, there's, that's going to be one of those situations where it may take a while. So we don't want to run that battery too low and it'll wake up and start transmitting this after five minutes after the power comes back on. All right, I know this is a sort of a blah looking screen here, but I did want to point this out. It's very important. 
our units will not transmit if you do not get a GPS lock. So if you're out there and you've got a canopy over your uh, RMU, it may take longer to find a GPS lock. It's trying to find the satellites out on the horizon if you got something directly above it. Or if you're testing the unit in your office and you get it all hooked up, you get power and try to transmit. So, well, I got good AT&T signal in the building. Well, it's still not going to transmit unless it gets a GPS lock. When we go to conventions, you see our units uh, fired up. They're they're interrupting, but what we have to do every morning is take them out to the street, wait for it to get GPS locked, then bring them back inside, and then they're good for the day. But it's got to get that GPS lock first. And sometimes that GPS lock may take a couple minutes. So if you've got it hooked up, don't expect it to transmit within two seconds after you power it up. Now we're going to talk a little bit about our Bullhorn Tools. Bullhorn Tools was just recently released with our satellite version of the RMU. Now, if what we see on this screen here is we've got an IO module with a red arrow pointing downwards. You're going to swipe downwards about where that red arrow is on the IO module to activate Bluetooth. When you go look for this IO module, you're not going to see that red arrow. You're just going to see that side of the IO module and the red arrow is just there for display to show you where to swipe today. Once you swipe, the Bluetooth light will come on blinking a little blue light showing it's ready to connect. Then you can connect Bullhorn tools. Once it connects, you're going to come to this information screen. Here, it's going to get you some pertinent information. It's going to tell you what your RSSI is, your signal of your unit. It's going to tell you if you've got a GPS lock. If you see your latitude and longitude, you've got a GPS lock. And it's also something very important. It tells you your firmware version of your unit. Those last three or four digits uh, to the right of your dome firmware and your I.O module firmware. This one says 12.5. You're looking for 12.4 or greater. If it's 12.4 or greater, Bullhorn tools will work fully functional. But if you have something older than that, it'll still pop up. It'll look like you can use Bullhorn tools, but it won't have all the functionality there because the firmware that allows for Bullhorn tools to work did not take place until version 12.4. And we've got some of our older cell units that were shipped before the satellite units that have 10.14 on it. And what we're doing, as soon as we see those come online, we're sending new firmware to them to get them up to 12.4. So Bullhorn tools will work. If it's something you've had on your shelf for for several months and you're getting ready to install it and you've got good signal, as soon as you install it, we're gonna to try to start installing that firmware. So it may take about 20 minutes before you can log in with Bullhorn Tools when that firmware gets updated. Mm -hmm. If you've got a weak signal, we're not gonna be able to update it right at that time. So you probably get right in with Bullhorn Tools, but you won't have the latest firmware. Now, if you notice up in the upper left-hand corner, there's three little dash lines there. Uh, I had recently had a customer tell me that they had three bars on their signal strength, and that one caught me off guard. I didn't know what they were talking about at first, but it's the three bars, which is our uh, menu icon. So, I mean, I definitely understood when I saw that because you look at bars on your phone, you think that's your signal strength. But in this case, that is our menu bar. Once you click on the menu bar, you'll see the info screen, which is your main screen, your readings, which is where you can see your channel readings, set up templates, set up your firmware, settings uh, for channel setup. So you can set up your shunts on your uh your AMPS channel, you can start interruption, send a test packet, it's gonna force a packet out, and you can disconnect from Bullhorn Tools. 
Now, I know one of your questions is, what if I forget to disconnect? Well, you've got to be within 12 feet of your IO module for Bullhorn tools to connect up. Once you get connected, it'll stay connected until you walk away or hit disconnect. If you get at more than 12 um, feet away, it's going to recognize that it's lost connection. It's going to time out shortly thereafter and turn off your Bluetooth. I did want to point out the reading screen here. This will show you readings of your bullhorn unit and give you your the reading at the time it took the reading of when it started up with bullhorn tools. If you're making adjustments to your rectifier and you want to see what your new readings are, you have to hit refresh in the lower right hand corner. If you don't hit refresh, it's just going to stay static and show you what that reading was when you started up uh, your bullhorn tools. Also in the upper right hand corner, it shows your DC input voltage. This is actually the battery voltage in the dome. You'll see DC input voltage on bullhorn web. You'll see it um, on several other things, but this is on this particular location is for the battery voltage in the dome. This one shows 3.9 volts. That is fully charged. And as I mentioned earlier, if it gets down to 3.6 volts, it will uh, turn the radio off and wait to charge back up. But uh, most of the time you're gonna see it anywhere from 3.8 up to four volts. All right, any questions for me now? I, I hear this a lot when I go around town, people ask me, what do you have any questions for me? And the first thing I always ask, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> I always get strange answers from that. I catch a lot of people off guard, but in this case, we're asking questions about the RM5. One thing for folks that are not familiar with Bullhorn Tools, the display will only show the unit when you are, like Mike said, within 12 feet of the unit and you've enabled. So if you load Bullhorn Tools, you download the app in your office and you um, open Bullhorn Tools, it won't show you any of the unit. So again, it's it's strictly just for Bluetooth configuration. Um, and then it'll also sync the configuration with Bullhorn Web. We had a question about uh the older firmware on the cell units with version 10.14. The Bullhorn tools will definitely start up on that, even some of the older versions, but it's not fully functional. It does look just the same. It'll show you your signal strength. Uh, you just can't uh, do all the functionality of setting up interruption and changing your shunt size with it there. Hey, Mike, one of the questions is, um, so on the new RM5 power supply, that um, that will work on legacy products as well, correct? Yes, and it will work on uh, either the older 4010 or 4014s or the same thing for their older power, power supplies that will work on this. We just prefer to, to use the newer one because it's hooked up uh, past the rectifier uh, surge protection and not as likely to take a surge from incoming AC. We had another question about the satellite um, antenna. If they, they need to get it up higher, do we sell an extension? And we do have extensions for those. We have a 20 foot extension, so you can get that dome up higher, get it above a canopy or a, up to a roof line so that you can get a better signal. Mike, I had another question come in about solar for RM5. Right now, um, I don't believe we have anything uh, for solar at this time, but I'll verify that and get back with an answer on that for sure. Okay.